to the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation's commemoration of the 55th anniversary of the signing of the National Historic Preservation Act, the statute that created the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. As we are the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, let's start with a little bit of history, why don't we? Uh, some history that led to the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act. So after World War II, with a rapidly growing population, continuing to need modern infrastructure and housing, the United States began to make major investments in highways, and urban renewal, and in public works like dams. Neighborhoods were destroyed, historic buildings razed, and archeological sites pillaged and ravaged. Government projects and suburban sprawl permanently altered the rural landscapes. The loss of the nation's heritage reached epidemic proportions. We began to realize as a country that we were losing our irretrievable cultural patrimony at an alarming rate, and citizens and officials took official action. A special committee of the United States Conference of Mayors in cooperation with the National Trust for Historic Preservation and several federal agencies began a study of protecting and ways we might protect America's historic cultural environment. And this was in January of 1966. The resulting report called With Heritage So Rich described the extent of heritage loss the breadth of public interest in preserving that heritage and recommendations for encouraging and supporting its preservation. The report outlined strategies that included government-led identification of place, places worthy of preservation, federal support for state and local preservation efforts, and processes to guide planning and review of threats to historic sites and buildings from those government actions. This report influenced Congress to enact a strong new statute establishing a nationwide preservation policy, the National Historic Preservation Act, signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson on October 15, 1966, only 10 months after the publication of With Heritage So Rich. Federal policy now encouraged the balancing of modern societal needs with preservation. It encouraged federal agencies to be national preservation leaders and manage and care for prehistoric and historic resources under their, uh, their, their control and their jurisdiction. And it forced both non-federal and private preservation activities uh, to, to play a role in this process. The Advisory Council on Historic Preservation's mission has been to promote the preservation, the enhancement, and the sustainable use of our nation's diverse historic resources and to advise the president and congress on national historic preservation policy we've assembled today a panel of historic preservation experts who will discuss the current status of preservation in the united states and the challenges that we're facing and how we move forward into the future i welcome your host today ACHP expert member, Luke Nichter. Luke has a sterling resume. He is the professor of history and the James H. Kavanaugh Endowed Chair in Presidential Studies at Chapman University in Orange, California. His specialty is the Cold War, the modern presidency, and US political and diplomatic history with a focus on the long 1960s something I can remember, <laughs> sad to say, from John F. Kennedy through Watergate. He is a noted expert of Richard Nixon's 3,432 hours of secret White House tapes and a New York Times bestselling author or editor of seven books. Gives me great pleasure to introduce Luke Nichter. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. It's wonderful to be here celebrating the anniversary of the signing of the NHPA, 
the National Historic Preservation Act, which has helped to preserve significant historic properties throughout our country over the last 55 years. Uh, you know, our goal tonight, we've been here for a half century. Our goal is to talk about the next half century. You know, where do we go from here? It's going to be sort of a central theme of our, of our panel discussion. And speaking of, we have an outstanding and distinguished panel, and I'm so excited to have the conversation that we're about to have. Uh, let's meet them. Uh, first, we have Robert G. Stanton, a former ACHP uh, expert member and former National Park Service director. We have uh, Reno Keone Franklin, the ACHP's tribal member, Indian tribal tribe member and chairman emeritus of the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians. And uh, last but not least, certainly, uh, Julianne Polanco, California State Historic Preservation Officer. Welcome to all of you. Well, the, NH, the NHPA was a groundbreaking piece of legislation uh, in 1966 that affected massive change in the way the federal government did business. I'd like to start our conversation by asking each of you to tell us what progress have you seen in historic preservation, uh, in your own work, we each have our own specialties, what great things are happening uh, in your communities now, um, and that will kind of help us to start a discussion about where we, we start with now and sort of where we go in the future. Um, so so let's, uh, let's turn it over then uh, to our panel and we'll kind of go kind of round robin, um, starting with Reno to, uh, to, to kind of see where you feel we stand now. Thank you. And we uh, do this right. And my Ewa, though she Emta Reno Keoni don't know Franklin. I am the Winema Bache Yakma, and and uh, just uh, hello everybody, Reno Franklin. Um, my name and uh, my language in Kashai is don't know, and uh, I come from the people from the top of the land. And um, what an what an honor to speak with uh, with this panel, this group that that uh, I get to talk with here today. Bob and Juliana are just uh, two people that I love a lot. So good to spend time with you and, and to consider uh, where the NHPA is at today, where they uh, should be, where it uh, shouldn't be um, in the progress. You know, I think, uh, I think from my opening statements, I'll keep it brief. I'll say that uh, you know, the, NH, the NHPA today uh, is more reflective than its initial version uh, all those years ago. I think that um, it has found ways to uh, become more useful for tribes. And, uh, and I think there, there's an excitement of that, um, you know, as tribes uh, becoming TIPOs and, and tribes using the consultation requirements in it to uh, further enhance our uh, protection toolbox, as you might call it, um, and, uh, you know, guardians of our history and our culture and the NHPA being um, a part of, uh, of that process for us. Uh, and, uh, and so it, you know, I think that, um, it's going in the right direction. I think that, uh, I'm curious to see what the next 50 years will look like and, uh, and looking forward to talking about that a little bit. So thank you. Thank you, Reno. Um, and Bob, you know, what's, what's your take on kind of where we stand and, and what you've seen? Let me, uh, hasten to, uh, ditto, uh, Reno's comments uh, that I too am humble and honored to be with him and to, with Julie, and certainly you do, Ken. But to have the opportunity to reflect on the uh, National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 and where we are today uh, is, uh, is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, again, like Reno, I, uh, I am encouraged by the progress uh, that has been made and continues to be, be made in an attempt to fulfill the letter and the spirit uh, of the act. And more recent uh, past, uh, I have really been uh, inspired by a seemingly renewed commitment on the part of the federal government, and the private sector, and major and local uh, preservation organization to give more support to the engagement of our youth uh, in this noble effort that we call historic preservation. Uh, I've looked at the uh, federal budget in recent past, more funding is being made available to support youth engagement in preservation and in conservation. The private sector is, uh, is boosting their contributions and, and uh, nonprofit organizations 
and also see the increase in terms of interns, uh, which I really, really support. And also many senior citizens, such as yours truly, are attempting to lend their mentoring services uh, to our young people. So that's one area in particular in which I am encouraged, but yet uh, much more needs to be done in terms of engaging our youth. Well, Julie, you have the difficult job of uh, batting clean up there because uh, lots of great points made. Uh, so uh, what would you add to that? It's my pleasure to be with you all today and thank you for inviting me. Um, I come from Wren County, California and respectfully acknowledge that this is the traditional home to the Coast Miwok people, many of whom are current citizens of the Federated Indians of the Great Rancheria. Um, I think cleanup with these two is really quite a pleasure and an honor. Um, I, I agree that, you know, going back to the preamble of our constitution in order to create a more perfect union, I think that says to me that we always assume improvement and the need for adjustment and reconsideration of where we've been and where we are in order to know where we're going. And so I think that the National Historic Preservation Act and its um, endurance over these past 55 years has shown us that it was a good start and it served a purpose to help us integrate culture, cultural heritage and values of our communities into the greater conversation of, of government and our public life. Um, but I think that we are at a, a precipice and what this pandemic has showed us and these slowing responses is that it re also revealed essential lessons, including the importance of heating science and centering the needs of our most vulnerable communities in decisions we make every day. Um, and that includes making sure that we have not just people at the table to understand and extract information from them, but really make sure that our processes are inclusive from beginning to end and, and, and include a, a partnership and a power source and a continued relationship to get us to where we need to go and what our communities need to both sustain themselves and be thriving into the future. I'm very hopeful. <laughs> very good, Julie. That, yeah, that's a great, I wrote that down, you know, that improvement's not automatic uh, or linear. Uh, in fact, we see it uneven a lot of times, and it takes continuous effort, which I think is all we're doing from our own uh, spheres. Um, well, you know, so I think that that, that conversation gave us a, a bit of a lay of the land and kind of where we stand now, you know, in, each, in, our, in our own work, our specialties, and our communities. Um, but, but let's talk about, you know, let's try, talk, try to be a little more forward looking in terms of where we go uh, from here. And uh, going back to Reno, um, you know, let's have another kind of round robin, um, you know, from, from where you sit, each of you sit, um, you know, tell us what you think are really among the greatest challenges that preservation, pr preservationists sort of in your world are facing today. It's, it's a great question. You know, and, and it's also kind of a two part question, right? There's this merging that we're seeing um, lately. Um, uh, and certainly the, the roster of tribal historic preservation officers is reflective of that. So you're seeing this merging today of um, tribal perspectives uh, and uh, what you know previously was an ethnographer or archaeologist perspective that was you know, um, writing tribal histories or participating in the, 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 the telling of tribal stories uh, and interpretation of tribal places. And so you're seeing more and more of a merge between those two things. Um, it's, uh, it's like culture and science sometimes, you know, never should be in the same room, but um, often are uh, in the same uh, cup of coffee to make it taste better. And, uh, and, and that's, I think, the challenge that, uh, that we as tribes face uh, in comparison with, um, you know, the, uh, the non-tribal aspect of, of preservation and historic preservation. Uh, and uh, sadly, uh, you know, sometimes very offensively calling us prehistory as if there was no history, uh, you know, that, <laughs> that mattered before. Um, I think that the challenges that are presented with um, trying to combine those two things, and, and it's a, an absolute must and a, and a necessary thing, is uh, as then we start to look at what what do our historic preservation laws look like, you know, and uh, and are they effectively doing the job that they're supposed to, um, and encouraging uh, for that tribal perspective um, to be told uh, in the first sentence and the non-tribal perspective of the same historic site second, 
And, uh, and, and it's something that I've hammered on for years in my entire career is the importance of um, tribal first. Everything's tribal forward, tribal first. And, uh, and there are reasons for that, in that um, nobody else can interpret place except for tribes. I'm blessed to be from Kashaya and, uh, and, and as a Kashaya person, Kashaya uh, Acha, um, we have very strict laws. And then one of them is that nobody else can interpret sacred for us. Uh, and so when we get it put into situations where you have multiple perspectives that are being um, brought forward on one particular site, um, it becomes dicey at best. It's, it's a challenge to do that and do it respectfully. And I think that the biggest challenge there is education and how we are teaching people who are practitioners of NHPA that are not Kashaya, but that are coming onto our lands um, to stop saying uh, proto Kashaya, proto Pomo, um, as if we weren't always here. And, uh, you know, it's this Bearing straight theory, which is now, I think, officially dead. Thank God, you know, but how long did we have to endure as tribes of the misinformation that uh, was spread uh, for, um, you know, decades about this Bering straight theory? And, and, and that leads into the biggest challenge, right, is the merging, again, like I said, of those two things, of that tribal perspective and the non-tribal perspective, but into that same place. So, um, I think that uh, as a challenge, tribes are doing a pretty good job of, uh, of getting ahead of this now and educating. I think that we use NHPA to do that, the requirements of it to do that. Um, it doesn't always work. I'm sure that we'll probably get into a few examples and you know, I'll talk about that. But um, I think that in the, in the areas that it does work, uh, it covers a lot of, a lot of ground and, um, and it, it becomes a very effective tool for us to use as tribes. So uh, the biggest challenge is, is, is finding ways to duplicate those, um, finding ways to hold up those mergings of the uh, tribal and, and non-tribal perspectives. And, uh, and then, you know, um, implementing those types of uh, best, best uh, case practices on a consistent basis through federal agencies who are um, using 106, using NHPA, um, to, uh, you know, to evaluate historic properties, protect them and save them. So I think that, that's my two cents on that. Hmm. So interesting. I, that's the second thing I wrote down here on the margin. Culture and science should not be in the same room. I think it's a good, it's, it's like a, a, just a piece of wisdom that you can apply to so many different scenarios, you know, in the policymaking world. Um, well, if you, well, if you're like me, I need to repeat the question <laughs> to remember where we were at. Yeah. But what we're talking about is, you know, in your, in your own world uh, and in your experience, the greatest challenges that preservationists are facing today. How about you, Bob? You know, where, where do you sit on this? Again, as Reno mentioned, that's a, an excellent question and one which uh, I reflect on a great deal, perhaps from different perspectives. But I think the, the greatest challenge that I see from a professional as well as from a personal perspective is that we have not been able for a number of reasons to really achieve the we in the preservation movement. We are not as inclusive as we should be. We are now a nation of over 330 million and still growing. But if I were to attend a conference focusing on historic preservation or educational program related to preservation, I would not see in the audience the face of America. With respect to the participation in the 106 process under the Historic Preservation Act or the 102 process under the National Environmental Policy Act, I would not see the level of the participation of the broadest spectrum of the American public possible. And until we can engage all America in this noble journey called historic preservation, we not, will not be as successful as we could be. So we must stay in the struggle to engage all our citizens in preserving our collective heritage. Our American heritage did not belong to any one group, racial, ethnically, economically, or religiously. It belongs to all of us. And until all of us take a possessive interest in this, we will, we will not achieve 
the greatness that historic preservation offers. But I remain encouraged uh, that we'll continue to make strides uh, towards reaching that goal. That is a challenge, one of the greatest challenges. Wow, I mean, the, the, the number of issues that we're dealing with here and, and, and the, the really how, how complex some of them are. I feel like we, we need to do, we could do a whole podcast or a whole series, you know, and, and pick out, you know, some of these different strains, uh, so much to talk about. Um, how about you, Julie, uh, based on, on, on your role, State Historic Preservation Office, Officer, um, you, you know, what are the greatest challenges that you see today? I think all of you have done a great job and you see where we're going with the questions because as a hint, we're going to talk about what do we do about these things next? Yes. How do we take action? But first, Julie, again, in the cleanup role, and I'll do something really crazy with the next question. We'll mix it up a little bit more. Um, but but what, what's your reaction to, to this conversation? To echo what Reno and Bob have said, I think the fact that our, our frameworks and our systems and our processes need to look like the faces of our communities in order for us to feel and understand that we've, we've hit that right mark. The question is, we always ask ourselves when we're doing our work is who's at the table and who's missing and what are, what are the barriers to entry and how do we remove them? How are we more creating more inclusive processes every day? And I think in the Section 106 realm, that's the, the majority of the work that we do under the NHPA is SHPOs. Now, we really focus on a couple of needs every day and challenges. One is in documentation. You know, we really need to understand what we have, what we're talking about, and have it accessible and, and easily readily accessible when we're working on the, the issues that we're trying to resolve, whether it's a new bridge or climate change or uh, affordable housing. Um, how do, what are we looking at? What are we considering? And how are we sure that that information is available so that we can make the best possible decisions? And then the second thing I think is that we need to really build and nurture relationships, that we need to do that in a way that res is respectful, um, that considers time, that learns and listens and not just extracts. Um, these inclusive frameworks are very important. The National Historic Preservation Act gives us these guidelines by including tribal nations and, and, uh, and communities, but how are we really doing that and how are we making these avenues of opportunity available and known? And I think the second thing is that Section 106, while it's intended to be a process of inclusion, seems to always be at the very end of entitlements for projects rather than at the beginning where it belongs or in the planning stage. Um, and so I think that we have to think about how we got that a little bit wrong and how we figure out how we're gonna get do better by it. Because when we get to a point where it's finishing a process rather than considering and listening and finding new collaborative ways to steward resources in the face of public safety or in the face of disasters. We really need to be building those relationships from the beginning so that the Section 106 process is the, the final part of a step rather than the beginning and the end of how we consider cultural heritage and community to be a convener, facilitator, um, and to help bridge these worlds of tangible and intangible heritage of government and community so that we are sure that our outcomes are sustainable um, and that they are going in the directions that our community demands of us as public servants. It's so interesting. And you also snuck in the C words there, climate change. So hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that in terms of future, well, present already challenges, but also future challenges. Um, but let's Let's move on. You know, we've talked a little bit about history and the present and kind of where we, you know, where we are now. Uh, let's also um, go back to Bob for a minute and let's talk about people. Um, and my question to Bob is, you know, uh, you know, we're talking about the we, the people. And as you, as, as you pointed out, we're still working on the we. So my question is, how, how do we get, how do we work on that? How do we make progress? How do we get more Americans, all Americans involved in historic preservation, especially young people, bring more people into the tent? I think it's from a, um, a, an individual professional leadership um, perspective, and then it's from an organizational perspective. I think those of us who um, enjoy the label, if you will, of being a preservationist, uh, that is a label that we do not accept or should not accept 
uh, in a passive role. It requires uh, that we be active, that we engage individuals in our respective uh, communities, in uh, our respective uh, states, and within throughout the country of advocating for preservation, outlining the, the benefits of historic preservation, uh, speak to our young people and encourage them to look at preservation as a career pursuit or career goal. Speak to our leadership in uh, government at the local, regional, state, or national level about the importance of preservation uh, to our country. In other words, we are to be a catalyst for change. And to be a catalyst for change, it means that we have to sometimes break out of our cozy shell and get out and do some groundwork in supporting of uh, historic preservation. But I, I, I also come to this uh, challenge, uh, Duke, uh, with the belief that we need to have a, a philosophical underpinning in terms of the, uh, the societal or the human benefits of preservation. And uh, as uh, Jordan and Reno and Julie know that uh, over some years in my, uh, my discussion of the importance of historic preservation uh, to uh, professional organization or to the lay community, I share this uh, philosophical underpinning or perspective, uh, which, which has guided me in terms of my uh, over 50 plus years uh, in, the, in the vineyard of conservation and preservation, primarily with the, uh, the National Park Service, the Department of Interior, and, and certainly the Advisory Council. And let me just share with you uh, this uh, philosophical perspective. In a real sense, the preservation of our historic places is more than the protections of buildings, artifacts, structures, and landscapes. Preservation demonstrates the values of diversity and community that honor and link us with the heritage of our predecessors and furthermore represent our individual and collective legacy to our successors. In other words, we can apply brick and mortar or proven architectural techniques, the genius of certain design, but if they don't inspire us to honor our past and build upon our past, to become better citizens, to be respectful of each other, respectful of our traditions, respectful of ways of life of those who may differ from us. If we don't achieve those intangible aspects of our humanity, then we can apply all the brick and mortar that we want to we have not achieved the real essence of historic preservation. Hmm. You know, it's so interesting, a theme in these comments is we might all be preservationists, but really we're in the people business, I think it is a, is a lesson from this. And I, I think, you know, over to Reno, um, you know, from your standpoint, when we talk about the people business, let's talk for a minute about nation to nation consultations and, and tell us, you know, from your perspective, where do we stand uh, today with regard to federal agency relationships with Indian tribes, Native Hawaiian organizations, and Native Alaskans? You know, that's a great question. And um, I think there's some, some glaring answers there. Uh, and it's kind of the funny thing here is that I, I'm, I'm 48 and, and at 48 you know, years old, I'm, uh, I'm pretty close to being historic. <laughs> I think it's two more years, right? And I'm eligible. Um, but uh, yeah, I was born into um, into a world that uh, was Kashaya centric, right? And it was um, uh, everything that I learned growing up, um, you know, uh, spending time on my reservation with my great grandparents inside of our roundhouse with our elders talking to us and hearing uh, Kashaya spoken as a first language inside of my uh, grandma uh, and her parents' home and, and just, uh, you know, being blessed with um, a Kashaya facing world in a cultural landscape that was um, centered around our culture. Um, I was insulated uh, from the things that were happening around us and uh, didn't have an understanding of um, the restrictions and the, you know, the fences that were being built and uh, the places that were um, being uh, thrown on top of our, our sacred areas. Um, you know, 
when you're born like that uh, in, into those kind of cultures as so many Indian people are, you know, you get this different perspective of um, what cultural law is. And uh, as you grow older, um, and you take career paths that lead you back to both leadership or servitude, service with your tribe or other tribes, or all tribes in my case, um, then you carry with you first your own perspective of historic preservation and what that means, right? And trying to separate out traditional knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge and every other thing that they have labeled what for me will always be Kashaya Tawi. Then you get to a certain age and you're confronted with um, other people that have a say uh, on your tribal lands and your cultural resources. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's a, that's a kind of slap in the face, you know, because I think that for a lot of us, not all tribes, but for a lot of us were raised in that, you know, like our cultural law is saying nobody can determine for Kashaya what is sacred. And all of a sudden now they're asking us to, to, ta- to explain it, you know, and to verify it, right. Validate. <laughs> it's like, who the heck, you know, who do you think you are to ask us that? And then, you know, I had a guy named Tom Gates. I became a tippo. He was young. He was in my thirties. Uh, and still really stupid, you know, fresh out of fire uh, and a uh, real gung-ho attitude. And nobody tells us there's a, a, a tippo here in California named Tom Gates. And uh, Tom was an Indian, you know, I don't even think he was like a, a, his specialty was like Chinese archaeology or something. It wasn't even American Indian stuff, but he knew NHPA inside out. And, and he told me like, this is your weapon. This is your weapon and your shield that you go to battle with. You carry this around with you everywhere. And when the federal agencies tell you something different, you hit him over the head with this thing. And then he thought about it. He's like, not literally, Reno. You know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, thanks. You know, and I took that to heart. Federal agencies do a decent job of implementation of NHPA and working with tribes. The um, agencies have gotten better. I can't imagine what it must have been like in the fifties or just what it, there was just none, you know, or, or you had some agencies with real inconsistencies, you know, based on individuals, you had this moral and ethical duty to consult with an Indian person that you knew lived right there before you went over and messed around with their graves. And for those that were um, immoral and unrighteous in their actions, uh, they ignored us and they went and did that to great detriment of our tribes and our tribal people. And I think that we're almost past that, right? We, uh, we, we have, um, you know, climbed that mountain of uh, moral and ethical, uh, responsible consultation with tribes in helping us um, to preserve our historic places from them, Right. Because we're, if we're left alone, we have no need for historic preservation as tribes. The only reason why we need that is because of you know federal, state, and local programs, projects that could potentially damage those sites. So, you know, we we talk about like how how are the agencies doing? You know, um, I think overall the inconsistencies, you know, don't allow me to 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 champion them and clap and say good job. Um, but at the same time, as, as odd as it is, NHPA can work. Um, and I'll, I'll give you two examples. The first one with Oak Flat, the most recent one. And, you know, <clears throat> Oak Flat on its uh, surface is an evil project. Oak Flat um, uh, at its very deepest and darkest and unseen, um, you know, objectives uh, is still an evil project, right? It's going to destroy a mountain that is just held sacred by so many tribes. And uh, at the end of the, the process that they went through for years, including, you know, congressional language and legislative language, a little bit different than policy stuff that, uh, you know, for historic preservation purposes that, that we see, um, you know, the thing that is killing that project is implementation of the National Historic Preservation Act and the duties to consult and the requirements thereof. I think that if we look and see 
how the NHPA is impacting tribes, the, the sum of its impacts to tribes is um, clearly and most um, obviously, sadly, and meaningfully shown uh, by the Dakota Access Pipeline. I think, uh, you know, the, the water protectors, uh, the Lakota governments, the Cheyenne government, Cheyenne River Sioux, everybody, all, all the uh, tribal side of that, and the environmental side, you know, we're all looking at um, the impacts that this project, the Dakota Access Pipeline, was going to have on these tribes. And, and in the end, um, you know, after unspeakable acts being committed to Indian men and women and uh, water protectors who were there to help them, um, you know, it was the NHPA, once again, the implementation of it that was uh, stood up as reason that um, they did not fulfill their duties and responsibilities to consult with tribes. So, you know, I, I, I think that that didn't exist 50 years ago. And I kind of keep going back to this because I'm almost 50, you know, uh, well, not, not to the extent that it does now, right? You had a TIPO that was involved in this. Wash Daywind, who's just an amazing TIPO that was working uh, and got completely ignored and documented it quite well. Um, and then you had, uh, you know, numerous tribes who went out uh, at the request of, of that tribal government, you know, Standing Rock Sioux asked a, a lot of us to come out. You had individuals like Myron Dewey, you know, a, a great Indian brother who has passed away last week, but that documented, you know, uh, through his use of drones, the abuses that were happening, those shocking images that the entire world was seeing. And, um, you know, when, you, when we talk about how effective is NHPA and how are our federal agencies doing with tribes on it, You've got both ends of the perspective right there in one event, and you've got the Army Corps of Engineers who grossly, um, you know, failed tribes uh, and um, didn't didn't comply with the requests of another federal agency, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. And uh, despite, uh, you know, um, Chairman Donaldson sending that letter to uh, Lieutenant General Bostic, you know, what, May 16th. May 19th, 2016 letter and it really outlined, hey, here's what you need to do. You're out of compliance. Army Corps just said no, right? So then we turn around, we look at it and say, well, okay, then there it is, right? There's your sum of how an HPA is doing for tribes right there. It's, you know, there's, there's hundreds of, of projects we could talk about, but very few that have um, the, the bipolar uh, ethical actions that, that took place there. And you had one end that was just Good, good on you, ACHP. Well done for calling it out and being honest about it. And then at the same time, turning around, like, oh man, Army Corps, what do you mean you're not going to do it? <laughs> Come on. I know lots of cool Army Corps people that are just awesome that probably were shocked by that and disheartened. Um, but, you know, in the end, there's still oil inside that line. So these small victories um, are tainted, right? And, uh, but, uh, but, but if you look at process, if you look at process that uh, was supposed to happen, a lot of those things did. And when it wasn't followed, it was called out in writing. And, uh, you know, and that should always be the basis for which action is taken off uh, against an agency uh, by other agencies in the courts. And, um, and, and I think that uh, overall, when we look at, uh, you know, what's happening with, the current state of uh, NHPA and its and its effects on tribes. The other thing that we we fail to look at, um, not fail, but you know, that's not consistent is, you know, the NHPA is the basis for a lot of these state laws that um, that like here in the state of California, you know, we've got CEQA and we've got the amendments to CEQA AB fifty two and uh, SB eighteen that you know have requirements in it to consult with tribes and meaningful meaningfully consult with tribes, you know. Um, to get past that generation of we're going to drive by uh, an Indian reservation and, and yell out federal project coming and uh, call that consultation, you know, to actually do some research. So, you know, uh, and HPA is the basis for a lot of those really good, um, you know, that really good, excuse me, work that's being done. And, uh, and, I, and I think overall we are uh, doing a good job of, of implementing NHPA as tribes. We just need uh consistency across the board with uh, the federal agencies who, who work really hard to get it right 
Uh, it seems like for every 10 that we get right, that one that's wrong is just so loud. So. Hmm. No, I, I think one of the themes uh, definitely in, in your, your answers, uh, both Reno and, and Bob is, you know, as much as uh, the idea of we, the people is unfinished, uh, as much as really our, what we're talking about is our democratic experiment is unfinished. Right. Um, ultimately, the NHPA implementation is unfinished. Right. Uh, so, you know, we've, uh, but I think Reno, Reno also mentioned toward the end there, the states. And so let's use that as a chance to get back over to Julie for a second. Um, and then af- then we'll, we'll I'll kind of throw a, a couple of general questions out for anybody to dive in uh, on. And we can kind of... Um, uh, weigh in together. But first, you know, Reno mentioned states, Julie. So, you know, we know uh, state historic preservation offices are hard at work on the state level. Um, you know, what are you seeing? Uh, Reno is talking about states and California, and you're right in the middle of that. What are some of the issues you're seeing um, that should be addressed? Well, I think um, just to go back to NHP and touch on that just a little bit, before I think about, before I sort of think about some specific examples of, of ways in which we advance the work together. So I think we're in a moment in time where we're making a big change in the continuum of history and in civilization. What's happening with Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement, what we're seeing post COVID and how we, um, we justly transition into whatever the world's gonna look like going forward we're reshaping society and more people are having a voice and more people are expressing their desires to be included. Um, And I think it behooves us as public servants to to understand that that is our role to be sure we're listening and we're adjusting and we're making processes that are stalwart, that show the possible, um, that set expectations and hold people accountable to words like meaningful consideration or meaningful engagement consideration and consultation. Um, and so I think it's it's the role of the State Historic Preservation Officer to set those expectations and emphasize what the National Historic Preservation Act tells us and be bold enough and brave enough to do it in the face of a lot of different pressures to move quickly or look the other way or um, give exceptions for values that may not be um, in, in Incongru- or that are incongruent with what um, what the science, what the culture tells us, what the people tell us, um, and, and what we know to be irreversible damage to things that are very important to people, life, um, and et cetera. And I think culture anchors people to places and to each other, um, and it can create cohesion in ways that enable community building and collective action. Um, and so we need to harness that and we need to really um, to, to really ensure that the frameworks that we're given, which I believe are malleable and strong enough to provide all the processes that we need to be successful, it's really reliant upon the partners and the actors um, to work together to ensure that. Um, what we're looking at in, in sort of a little bit of tipping about the future is being involved in the climate change conversations. I think that as a profession, Historic preservationists have gotten to a space where they are experts. They understand and know and contribute in ways that others do to science and decision making. Um, But we've also sort of backed ourselves into a professional corner, I think, and and the topics of inclusivity and how we engage our youth and are we really listening are really those that sort of rise to our consciousness as we think about how we look internally to make the changes that are needed to help steward cultural heritage um, into the future. Uh, And so I think when we're looking at how we clean our own house, um, it's really important to say that we will always be the experts in our roles. And I don't think that's ever gonna be diminished, but we need to not be afraid to participate in bigger forums so that we're ensuring that culture is at the table and has a voice and can contribute to, um, to multidisciplined outcomes rather than um, sitting in the corner waiting to be on the chopping block. Um, and I think that's why our office in the state of California has actively engaged in the role um, in the space of climate action to provide those opportunities to help culture play a role in the behavioral changes that are necessary for climate action to be successful. I um, mean, also you know, cultural heritage, 
places and spaces have different meanings to different people. What a building means to me or what a structure or a landscape means to me is a very different thing than maybe it means to Reno or to Bob or to any of us. So I think that as preservationists, we need to be sure that our voices and those collective voices are present as toolkits are being created, as decisions are being made, and that we're part of those check-in and rebalancing processes through the, through the continuum of solutions so that we, we are being sure that those values are, um, are present and part of, part of solutions and part of sustaining communities into the future. Yeah, it's so, so interesting, all the points here. You know, I feel like we could take this show on the road you know, to every community in the country to begin to, to I think, spread awareness of, of, of some of these points. Um, but you know, for, for a moment, you know, let's, we've talked about the past and, and the present, you know, let's talk about the future for a minute. And, and this, for a historian, this is dangerous because I can barely make sense of the past. It's something I often say to my students. I certainly don't try to make sense of the present. And the future is just something we don't talk about. Although, of course, you know, where we're headed is sometimes indicated by where we've been. Um, so I've got two final questions that I'll just kind of throw out there uh, to the group and feel free to, to dive in if you, if you see fit. Um, but, uh, you know, the question is, um, you know, really, where do we go from here? Um, you know, what would you like to see preservation uh, do? What direction should we move in the future to address uh, the many challenges that you've each brought up um, and, and really move us forward in our work, our individual work, our collective work with regard to preservation? Let me uh, give a crack at that, uh, Duke. Um... I think we, uh, we need to be held accountable as professionals and individuals in this uh, noble effort called historic preservation. I, uh, I often reflect back on uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors report with Heritage So Rich, which really uh, stimulated Congress, the administration at that time, other leaders such as Stuart Lee Udall, George B. Hartsall, and others uh, to, uh, to craft this bill signed into law by President Johnson that we know as the Historic Preservation Act. And then subsequently, uh, taking a look at the resolution endorsed by the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, on the 50th anniversary. And then I applaud the, uh, the leadership of the council in working with uh, the trust, the National Park Service, the State Historic Preservation Officers, and uh, developing an excellent report on the 50th anniversary of the act. And within that report, it contains uh, a series of recommendations uh, umbrellaed by uh, 13 major categories, which it states these are some of the issues these are some of the challenges and we commit ourselves of forging ahead. So the question that I would pose, have we had a reality check in terms of what we committed ourselves to five years ago? And I uh, submit that we need to evaluate what progress we made uh, since we've issued this report and say that we we're gonna address these, uh, these things, many of which have been touched upon here uh, in this discussion, uh, certainly the uh, tribal relationships, uh, uh, the sovereign tribal relationship, climate change, uh, lack of uh, diversity and inclusion, and a number of issues. Have, you know, have we really made any progress which we say we're gonna do on our 50th anniversary? And I submit that, uh, that the, an evaluation of where we are and what our mountains are and what our, what our valleys are in that effort. And I would further suggest, in terms of looking at the future, uh, that we, uh, from the results of this uh, critique of what progress has been made in the past five years in terms of our commitment, what will be our deliverables uh, from now to our 60th anniversary, which interestingly enough coincide with the 250th anniversary of the founding of our nation. And hopefully we'll be able to report out uh, collectively uh, the, on the 250th anniversary that uh, the endeavor called historic preservation is live and well, as opposed to say that we're on live support. 
Uh, so I, I just think that we need to hold our cap accountable. We made some commitments and the American public will raise the question, are you delivering my preservationist friend? Julie or Reno, um, any any thoughts? I, I hear uh, accountability, but I hear a, a hope, optimism, perhaps. You got to have that. <laughs> Coming from the era of separate but equal, it was only optimism, encouragement, and a hell of a lot of prayers that got us uh, this far. <laughs> that didn't, that Bob, didn't work out very well. Um, go ahead, Reno. Actually, I was just going to say, Bob, I'm going to pass it to Julie and let her go first because uh, you are my dear friend and uh, and it's disrespectful for me to speak before you. Oh, thank you. I, I, uh, I, I feel like we are also together in this conversation and, and our, our uh, mutual desire to create that more perfect union for, for all of our citizens. I think that what, what can we do? How do we improve? I think we need to connect cultural heritage to people their well-being and their sustainability in a Western world, um, and the way that tribal peoples live every day. I feel like that mm. that connectivity and that lack of human man-made division is is sort of what is our um, what will be the death of us if we don't correct that course. Yep. Um, and and we need to look to uh, our tribal partners and our tribal leaders as as the example. Of, of how we do that in, in, a, in a cohesive and a comprehensive way. I think that we need to understand and to demonstrate that the assets and the resources that culture and preservationists and heritage actors bring to the table um, as a partner and a viable partner and not just a checklist. Um, it, it is very, very vital to the values of our society and how do we, how do we demonstrate that? How do we share that? How do we, um, excite and encourage people to join in that conversation um, in ways that are sustainable for heritage and communities. Um, I think that those are our biggest challenges. And, and also, how do we incorporate youth and technology? You know, the way that I still write things in paper, um, I'm not sure that kids write very well because they know how. So how do we <laughs> make this topic relevant to the children that are going to take it over and pass? Are we passing a baton or a laptop or um, a who knows what kind of technology will will bring and how are we keeping those values of culture and the importance to everyday sustainability in the technology world in a way that the next generation will want to pick up that mantle and carry it and see it as a value to their life and i think those are the things that we will be judged on by the next generation and hopefully we won't disappoint them excellent yeah it's it's a Technology is a challenge, you know, um, it's a challenge that uh, we are failing at. And, um, and I'll give you some examples here. Uh, the mission system in California um, um, was more destructive to California Indians than the gold rush. Uh, and um, the boarding school system throughout the United States and into Canada um, was a, uh, an act of genocide on Indian people. And um, it's the, the grounds of those boarding schools are littered with the dead Indian children that were never given the proper rites of passage into the next world that their ancestors died trying to provide for them. I hope that statement resonates in anybody that's watching this. And my tie to technology is that I didn't have the internet as a kid. I went and I did and, and went to the mission and, and, and was like interesting as a young man here at, uh, in Sonoma County without realizing, you know, at six years old, the atrocities that were committed to my people in that place. Um, we've got kids that uh, had seen boarding schools and uh, seen what they were and uh, never really understood uh, what that history was in that past. The, the modern day boarding school for Indian children, for the most part, is kids not behaving, let's send them to boarding school. I had a nephew, I'm not going to out him and say which one it is, but uh, <laughs> he was sent to a boarding school for that reason. But technology, where we fail, where all of us, all of you watching this are failing miserably, is, is my buddy Myron, Myron Dewey, who understood that digital technologies and tribes could tell a story and understood that our kids are going to judge us 
on the fact that we didn't teach them the true meaning of these places and they now have the ability to look that up instantly from their cell phone while they're in the class hearing the garbage about well, how great the missions were to uh, California Indian tribes. They're literally sitting on their cell phone going, BS, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> we fail. We're failing that. Technology, we fail. And, you know, and, and the, 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 we talk a lot about digitization and ways that that'll help. And that's true. Those are good ways to help. But when we talk about the youth and the engagement of the youth, I have to sit in front of my, uh, my teenage kids who, uh, who are masters at research and finding and creating funny memes with their dad's face on it. And, uh, and I have to be accountable to the information they know. And I can't fail them one of two ways. I can't not provide information and I can't let them get the wrong and incorrect mm, information. Yeah. And that's the big one, right? You know, we have to protect that. So, so when I think about hey, where we are going as a nation with historic preservation, what does the next 50 years look like? I have one selfish statement that I want to make, uh, and that is because I am uh, the sole Indian and native Hawaiian. You know, I'm a Makaivi. My family is from Molokai, Hawaii. My mom, I love her, Pearl Anku, Lani Makaivi. Um, you know, and my grandfather, Kenneth, because there's no Kenneth in Hawaiian that they couldn't pronounce the th. And so his name is Kenneth. You know, I, I was raised uh, and, and, and taught two different cultures. Um, but as the sole representative on the ACHP that is uh, designated to that position as the American Indian uh, uh, member of the ACHP, I need like three or four. There needs to be more of us. Native Hawaii should be represented at the table and not embodied in one person, two nations embodied in one person. I have way too many Indians that I have to be accountable for, way too many of my uh, Samoan brothers and sisters in Guam and Puerto Rico and the outlying territories. And then, and then the tribes and Hawaii and, and uh, the Alaska Natives. Um, we need more. We, we need to have uh, more voices and uh, take some of that, that weight off of my shoulders that is equally spread around. Believe me, I make sure. But um, I don't want to set this up for myself. I want to set this up for the next 50 years. And what should that look like? It should look like more representation of Indian people at the ACHP. I was blessed to have Leonard and Dorothy and some amazing tribal folks while I was, you know, uh, while, while, while they were there working with me and you, Bob. And, uh, you know, and then, um, and then they were not reappointed. Uh, and on all that's left from Obama is Jordan, who was basically Indian at this point, and myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, you know, kind of a little bit of selfish things, NHPA in the next 50 years, in order for it to be successful, in order for historic preservation to be successful, and, uh, and, and bookmark this, there must be a criteria E that is tribal designations for the National Register on historic places. We need a tribal criteria that's just for us, not a criteria that says, oh, uh, we have to go collect data and uh, sketch the remains of individuals uh, or, uh, or, or put all of these artifacts that are to you are everyday things that you would still use, but we'll call them artifacts and let's put them in a museum. No more of that. No more of that. Unless tribes through free prior and informed consent say, yeah, that's what we want done. It needs, we need to recognize and come up with a way for a tribal designation that doesn't take any of that other stuff into account, except for what it means to a tribe and is listed as that because true history in these here beautiful United States starts with us. But yet we're last to the table when it comes to uh, preservation policy, preservation law that needs to change, that must change in the next 50 years if, uh, if our tribal um, sites and our tribal interpretations uh, and our tribal traditional knowledge and cultural knowledge of all these places is to be respected the way that it should. And, uh, and I, I think that in order to uh, achieve true equity and true inclusion for historic preservation, uh, that is the path forward. And, uh, and I'm happy to write something up that, that says it too and work with a, a whole bunch of other people on what that uh, criterion E is going to look like for that tribal designation to the National Register. Um, Mr. Chairman, I uh, I fully uh, endorse Reno's uh, 
I think there's two recommendations, one in terms of representation around the table of uh, the board of uh, directors for the, uh, for the advisor council in terms of representation of American Indian native of, uh, of Alaska and, and Hawaii and maybe Puerto Rican, whomever, Guam, American Samoa, and then the uh, designation of the National Register. Uh, the uh, the uh, Historic Preservation Act has been amended 15 times, 15 times. And, I, and, and what I'm deducing from uh, Reno's uh, eloquent uh, suggestions is that there could be a legislative mandate uh, evolving from that or a legislative proposal. And I would, I would be very supportive. This, this discussion may be outside the realm of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of this panel discussion, but I think that he has put before a, uh, two suggestions that I think merit some immediate attention uh, by us and uh, those of us in the preservation field. I, I'll be willing to, uh, to be a voice for that, Reno. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, we, brother, yeah, we. Okay. Good. I also want to to say that I absolutely concur and agree. I think that we 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 have to move beyond asking people to justify their culture and their heritage and their significance. Um, yeah. We have to move beyond that. It's yes. insulting. It's 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 a it's of a time that belongs in the past. It doesn't even have a place in our present. Um, I think we need to bolster programs that tell all stories and make sure all stories of a situation, of a history, of a place are available and told and known so that our present and our future can be further enriched by the complexity and the layers um, in ways that we celebrate, commemorate, and illustrate, as the National Register tells us. And I think those words are so interesting because I think many people think that the listing is a celebration um, or a commemoration, but I think they also illustrate, and that word illustrate, I think is more what is the category of the things we have left to capture because they're ugly and they're not so nice and they come with a lot of strife and a lot of people then assume blame or responsibility or grief over these things, but without telling them, we are not finding ways to move forward and move beyond them. and. I think that that really is our charge and our goal to be sure that the illustration is just as much part of the register as the celebration and commemoration, that triad of things and more um, are really the strength and the, the blessings of our community that the National Historic Preservation Act and the work that we do um, envisioned that we protect and steward um, and I think until we make sure that those are complete and those complexities are um, acknowledged, we, we will continue to have work to do. And I um, celebrate that we will do it together. And I think that a lot of our partners are with us in this um, quest. Um, and I see the future is very hopeful for all of those things coming to fruition. Well, very good. <clears throat> Now, I feel like we could all, well, let's all plan to assemble again for the centennial. Uh, I may not be here, but I think Bob will probably be here still. <laughs> um, but you know, the NHPA, you. <laughs> the, uh, Julie mentioned the NHPA a, a couple times in your response there. So let's circle back, you know, to where we started this conversation. Um, and um, you, know, you there, but there's, there's one, one question left I have for you. You've all passed the test, you know, up to this point. Um, but, you know, it's really the National Historic Preservation Act is what brings us together. It brings us together in our work, obviously, um, but more tangibly, it brings us together here for this conversation today. Uh, so the final question is, why is the NHPA still important today? And how can it aid the American people in preserving our country's history going forward? Hmm. Well, jump in at once. Yeah, I was just gonna <laughs> please, please. Gonna say, go, go ahead, Reno. Start. No, I, 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 I'm still trying to read this thing here that I had an answer written out for this, and uh, can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say, why is it important? Well, we're historians, right? We are people who love the past and honor the past, and perhaps the, 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 the sheer fact that it's something that's known and that we use um, is. Is, is part of the nostalgia of why the NHPA, but, but it's also acknowledging that it's not static, 
that it's a, a thing of constant, constant improvement and constant expansion. And it's, just, it's supposed to be as big as communities in our, in, in our ever-changing country um, and demographics would like us to have. So I'm not sure that we need to sort of throw everybody off the boat and, and shift into another mode of transportation because I think that the tools are there and I think that the flexibility to make the right changes, the necessary changes are there. But I think it, what we need to do is find um, the right spaces and the right conversations and, and make sure that the right voices are at the table to determine where we want to go, like where are we headed, what direction are we rowing in together, and what does that look like. So um, I, I feel like we could either throw it over and spend our time creating new framework, or we could adjust and improve upon a framework that, that gives us every opportunity to succeed and just do better. And as Bob said, it's been amended uh, 15 times. So uh, uh, obviously it gives us, uh, at least in theory, a flexible enough structure going forward. So maybe sweet 16 really is the number. <laughs> well, and in response to Reno, uh, you know, a reasonable request should receive a reasonable response. Uh, I think to Reno's point too, you know, we have to stop asking one person to speak for the totality of a group. And yeah. we have to stop expecting that they have the right or the knowledge or the desire to do that um, and stop counting numbers. We have a project that we're working with the California Indian community and the, the list of possible invitees was about a hundred. And people kept saying to me, how are you going to choose among those hundred? And I said, I'm not choosing. We're inviting everyone and exp explaining what we, our purpose is and allowing people to decide if they want to join us. And we hope they will. And if it's a hundred, we'll figure it out. And it's five, we'll figure it out. And if it's none, then we won't do it because then it shouldn't be done. And so we have to not be afraid of inclusivity as a way to dilute the, the, the outcome or the, what we're trying to achieve, but recognize that by being inclusive and inviting the many voices to the table, we, we get the better outcomes that are more sustaining. I, I, I think that to answer your question, I'm gonna read something really quick from Bulletin 38, the Bulletin 38. And it says, historic properties represent only some aspects of culture and many other aspects, not necessarily reflected in properties as, much, as such, may be of vital importance in maintaining the integrity of a social group. However, the National Register is not the appropriate vehicle for recognizing cultural values that are purely intangible, nor is there legal authority to address them under Section 106 unless they are somehow related to a historic property. That is an entire line of thinking that uh, existed. And when we talk about going back to the very first question, where are we at today? Um, our goal is to look as tribes and as tribal historic preservation practitioners is to look for, find and weed out that type of thinking. I saw a, uh, an archaeologist for the Society for American Archaeology, I believe, could be wrong, on a conference call, um, do a Hail Hitler and, and salute, a Nazi salute. Uh, I have seen some pretty atrocious things. I, uh, I saw a, uh, last week, was notified of an uh, archaeological professor at San Diego State, excuse me, uh, San Jose State University, that uh, posted an image of her talking to the skull of an Ohlone, Ohlone person uh, and, uh, and, and um, having a little fun conversation with the skull uh, and then claim ownership rights of that. It is time to weed out this type of thinking. It's time to find it and say that it no longer defines us. The problem with these people is that they don't realize that everything they're doing creates this digital signature that is going to be forever researched by youth and there are going to be people like me on my deathbed encouraging them to do it and go and find these people out know who they are and do everything you can to discredit that type of thinking and that type of mentality it's time for our generation bob yours mine julie all of us together um, to look at setting a 
benchmark for the uh, ethic, ethical reasons and uh, techniques used for historic preservation. It's time to look at and setting those benchmarks and making sure through legislation that they're followed and that um, this individual from uh, San Jose State University who spoke to the skull and handled it in her house, by the way, surrounded by boxes, mm. boxes of artifacts that belonged to the university in her home, not kept in the, the proper way, not kept with free prior informed consent of the individuals, but yet she chose to get on her high horse and do this and disrespect all those tribes. And it's just, I think it's time that, you know, we find ways to um, study our past that are ethical, that are moral. And I think that we have so many that do that. And I do think that we could do a better job of highlighting that um, and do a better job of punishing those who choose the, uh, the former uh, and, and to not do that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we as a, as a group, you know, can, can look at the intent of, of Bulletin 38 and uh, understand that. Um, you know, both uh, Dr. Keen and his amazing wife that wrote that together, um, that uh, they were handcuffed in some ways and what they uh, could and couldn't say in changing uh, the thinking of America and to, to recognize that not every historic property is um, going to have a building on it, right? We, we do a great job of calling a historic property the site of a former school that used to be there a former library that used to be there. But uh, for a house pit that has now uh, a road driven over the top, it's not. You know, for um, one of the uh, sacred things that belong to my tribe, that uh, there's a vineyard that they're trying to put over the top of some of our areas where they had bulldozed a roundhouse site that's happening right now in Seaview in, in, in Sonoma County here. And, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to look at that and say, well, it's bulldozed, so it's no longer you know, has structural integrity, the site has been compromised. Well, the guy that bulldozed it is the one that, you know, is now trying to plant on top of it. Same thing goes for the levees in Sacramento. You know, well, there's human remains in there, but they don't qualify because they bulldozed a long time ago this village site to make this, uh, this levee to protect us all from flooding. Um, so sorry, it's not on the National Register. That's section 106 not going to apply to it because it doesn't have a uh, National Register eligibility because there's only pockets of human remains and nothing intact. That's some pretty crappy stuff. And I heard that about um, African Americans when I was down in New Orleans doing a tour and into Mississippi. And the same thing, they were taking uh, the uh, the African American of uh, slave cemeteries and bulldozing those and uh, using them to make levies. Uh, and and certainly they were hearing the same type of things there. And it doesn't stop. And it's not just. You know, people of color, it's, it's all people in the Scottish, they put up with that. You know, and the Italians, they put up with that. You know, and, and certainly, you know, our, our uh, Latino, uh, Latino Latinx relatives and loved ones have put up with that as well. And our Asian friends that have were come, brought out here to California, United States, to build these railroads and, and treated just horribly. I don't think we do a good enough job of uh, righting those wrongs. And I, and I, I would finish this answer by saying that, you know, Vin Deloria Jr. talks about the um, writing the, the wrongs and, and how we can do that. And he's, he's really specific when he talks about the, um, you know, the political ownership of the land, um, the non-Indian people, and the spiritual ownership of the land, which would be Indian people, and how our history can never reconcile because uh, un until they can never reconcile until those two come together and find a way to merge. And I think that the next 50 years, we had better figure that out. And we had better reconcile that political and spiritual ownership of the land. And I'd take it a step further in saying that NHPAA can be a tool, one of many tools in the toolbox for, uh, for that reconciliation. And, uh, and I hope that uh, I don't saddle my son and my amazing daughter's uh, and uh, with, with um, having to pick up the mantle where I found it. I hope that for all of us, um, that mantle is, uh, is, is built solidly and, um, and we can look and stand upon it uh, shoulder to shoulder with each other and say, hey, look what we did, not look what, how much farther we have to go. Hmm. Hmm. Well, Bob, you have the final word. 
I think has been uh, very well illustrated in the uh, discussion is that historic preservation of our tangibles and intangible heritage resources have many benefits. But I think one of the prime objective of historic preservation is contribute to our education. The literary critic Matthew Hall observed that education is not a getting and having, but rather a growing and becoming. It is my hope that as we continue this journey in preserving our collective heritage, that we'll continue to grow, continue to be, become better citizens. And as uh, has been mentioned on several occasions, we have an obligation. We have an obligation individually and collectively to give meaning and substance and sustainability to that beautiful pronoun, the first word in the preamble of the Constitution of the United States, we. Such a beautiful expression. And one day we will have the we fully in the preservation movement. And that can only be achieved by educating ourselves, respecting all of our cultures and traditions. And we will become a we, the people. Thank you again for this great opportunity. Well, I think, I think we, in this case, there's no better ending than that. Uh, so I, I'd like to uh, take a moment to thank our distinguished panel, uh, Robert Stanton, Reno Franklin, and Julie Polanco. To our viewers, thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please contact the ACHP at achp at achp.gov. Again, I'm Luke Nichter for the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. I don't have any party hats or noisemakers, but happy 55th anniversary, everyone. Mm -hmm.